and this creates contextual interference. So my students are getting used to uh, open guard stuff. We do that for a half hour and then all of a sudden they're defending arm bars and their brain is like, what the fuck are you doing to me? Like, I, I'm not ready to defend arm bars. Okay, I guess we got to do it anyways, right? What's the most efficient path to victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off for the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tiny to Delpra. Hello, welcome to the Essential Jiu Jitsu Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kwan. The Essential Jiu Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu Jitsu. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to discuss three months of using the ecological approach. My main takeaways to this method, we're going to reiterate what the constraint-led approach is, and also I'm going to give my tips and things to look out for for anyone who's looking to implement this approach with their students. Before I do that, please like, share, and subscribe wherever you're listening to this show. Share it with your teammates. Leave comments in the comment section if you can. If you want to support the show or contact the show, please check the links below. I will leave them in the description. Let's get to it. So let's just talk about the constraint-led approach and what that is. So constraints are essentially limitations that you can put around practice where the athlete or performer can use to build certain skills. So by modifying these constraints in practice, a coach can bring out optimal performance in an athlete. So rather than a coach showing an athlete how to do something or saying, hey, you're doing that wrong, let's do it this specific way, they're basically just getting the athlete to do live training, but they're building constraints around the training to bring out certain skills in the athlete. So the student or the performer, athlete, whatever you want to call it, they have to quote, self-organize to generate effective movement solutions. So it almost puts the um, it almost puts the responsibility on the athlete to find the correct solution. And again, Greg Souders looks at uh, fighting as a problem that requires a solution. <laughs> in this case, in jiu-jitsu, the solution is to score or to get a submission, right? Or it might be as minute as just manage distance, right? So when you use this approach with an athlete, they have to find their own solutions. They're not just listening to the coach spoon feed them technique information and trying to regurgitate it in a situation. They're actually using their own self-organization within live settings under, uh, under specific constraints. So self-organization is the student finding ways to complete a task or find a solution within a specific training constraint. Constraints can be modified to develop these, uh, sorry, they can be modified within these three areas. There's the student or performer, the environment, and the task. And the task is the most common way, place to add constraints because it's very easy to do so, okay? So <clears throat> let's go over these three things. The individual or the student. The student can vary in many different ways. They have different body types, ages, fitness levels, uh, fle uh, flexibility, you know, different attributes, strength, speed, s different skill levels. So you're going to, the things that you will ask a beginner might not be the same thing that you're going to ask a black belt. Uh, another thing that the student might vary in is their intentions within the sport. So a grandma might come to you and say, hey, I need to learn. How I just want to uh, have some fun and make some friends. Okay, you're going to be very recreational. You know, uh, you might be limited by your age and your attributes. Whereas if a 20-year-old athlete comes to you as a black belt and says, okay, I want to be, be uh, successful in a specific tournament, you're probably going to have different goals and different expectations for that 20-year-old, right? So you do have to assess these things. Everyone's different. Everyone has a different level of skill and fitness. Now let's talk about the environment. So the environment is where the practice takes place. Let's take the sport of soccer, for example. There's many, many cases where soccer coaches will modify the size of the field or the size of the ball. By modifying the size of the uh, field, let's say you're making the field larger, for example. Okay, So a larger field might help players to defend large spaces as a team unit or as an individual. 
and it also helps players learn how to exploit large spaces when going on the attack, whereas a smaller field could test the player's um, uh, speed and reaction times and decision-making in tight quarters, as well as coordination, and, you know, it's almost like two boxers in a phone booth going at it, right? Um, the shape of the field might also be altered to get the athlete to develop specific solutions within the same game. So this is a concept called repetition without repetition, which we will be discussing, but you could make the field more wide. You can make the field more narrow. You could make the field, uh, you could play on sand. So that's harder to run. You could play on dirt, which is very common in a lot of Southern American countries. You, uh, so that it's, it's a different, you're playing the same game, but it's in a different environment. And, Thus, the athlete has to modify how they move their body and sort of still perform the same task under different variables. Also, a, a smaller ball could be used. So this is very, very common in soccer training. They will uh, make the size of the ball smaller, and then that way the athlete has to, um, it's more difficult for the athlete to dribble and be coordinated with the ball Etc. Etc. In a gi situation, you might ask an athlete to use a heavier gi so that it weighs them down or is harder to, I don't know, function. Uh, likewise, you could do that to make it more difficult for your uh, the other athlete to grip you. In a no gi context, you could you could grease in practice. You could make it simulate it being more slippery so that when you go into an ADCC and you don't have to wear a rash guard, and athletes might be greasing and people are getting sweaty as the match goes on, you have to kind of modify your motor skills and your techniques to work against someone who is slippery and someone who is greasing. Locked hands, body locks, etc. You could train without a shirt to simulate this slipperiness. Uh, I know a lot of Krav guys who train in the dark just to simulate a real-life situation where maybe they're in a nightclub or multiple attackers um, it's not uncommon for jiu-jitsu fighters to train in intense heat or for combat athletes to train in elevated areas as well. These are all ways that you can modify your environment. And then lastly is modifying the task. And this is the easiest way to use the constraint-led approach. So imagine you are modifying the sport or specific task to require a specific solution. So coaches may manipulate the rules of training um, to help convey a training goal. Training specific positions for very uh, specific goals. Like, okay, we're gonna start in a cross face and underhook half guard and I'm just gonna hold it as long as I can. I'm not gonna try and pass, I'm just gonna see, can I maintain immobilization of my partner in this position? And if your partner escapes, you just go again, right? Rather than being like, okay, it's a live round from half guard, we make very, very specific goals to try and bring out specific solutions from the athlete. Uh, another thing you could do would be to train when you're exhausted or train when you uh, require rest, right? Like not taking rest breaks in between rounds just to simulate exhaustion. You could create situations where uh, you are down points in sparring and your partner, uh, you need to catch up within a certain amount of time as your partner is ahead on the scoreboard Hypothetically, you could create situations where your partner is trying to stall you or shut you down. And this would be actually a very effective strategy because in grappling, this happens a lot. You know, you get up on the scoreboard and then as much as we're, we don't like to advocate for stalling, it is a way that you can win jujitsu tournaments and you will come ag uh, across athletes who stall. And so what you could do is create solutions when your partner is trying to stall or shut you down. All right. I just want to discuss now some of the things that Greg and I discussed on the phone call that I had with him when I was in Mexico three months ago, and I, I made I made that decision. Okay, I'm gonna we're gonna do the ecological approach. We're gonna try it. I had a phone call with Greg, and Greg told me about what he uh, his his analyzing the problem of fighting is how he described it. So he just looks at fighting as a problem to be solved, just like you, any athlete could look at any sport as a problem to be solved. Okay, so he says, all fighting has the same central problem, the movement problem. And that's basically just saying that you're never going to fight someone who's not moving. You're always going to have 
Somewhat when you're striking with someone, you're always going to have someone who's bobbing and weaving, trying to move their feet, stay out of striking range, and then come into range and strike you and get back out of striking range again. In grappling, you're never just going to be able to apply an arm bar on someone. They're going to be keeping their arms tight to their body. They're going to be trying to also, you know, break your arms. So there's always going to be the problem of movement in combat. What's the solution? The solution is immobilizing the body. Um... And that will allow an opportunity to actually cause damage to someone, whether it's by submission or by striking. He says the foundation of all engagements in jiu-jitsu, maintaining connections and managing the distance. So uh, you're always going to try to maintain connections with your partner. If you don't have connections with your partner, you can't control them. And managing the distance, preventing them from essentially getting to a position where they can immobilize you and start to isolate your limbs. He talks about um, he d- he talks about these four different tasks. I I guess you could co- describe them as there's com- complex and continuous tasks, wh- which would be like an action, like a guard pass, a big score. Okay, these require lots of steps. Uh, a serial task where there are, um, a serial task is like where there are certain steps required that need to happen for a technique to work. There are discrete motions, so f- breaking mechanics, finishing mechanics, finishing an armbar, finishing a heel hook, finishing a strangle, etc. So dialing in small mechanics, and then there's structural destabilization. And he always talks about this in his videos. You can go on YouTube and watch his videos. He actually puts up his class breakdowns on YouTube, kind of like I do, but he does a much better job with his video editing and whatnot. And he talks about the the structural destabilization coming in two forms: breaking mechanics and Kazushi, off-balancing someone. And these are kind of like the four main four main pieces to, uh, you know, controlling someone in jiu-jitsu, immobilizing someone, uh, performing a task on someone. All right, he talks about three macro situations. So this is how he essentially categorizes the positions in jiu-jitsu. It's very, very vague, by the way, right? You could be as vague as or as specific as you'd like in this situation, but he talks about three mac- macro situations. There's the standing situation, right? Standing versus standing. There's guard top versus bottom situation. And then there's pinning top versus bottom situation. So you can see how vague these terms are. Standing situation, obviously two people standing. Guard top versus bottom could be half guard, could be open guard, um, could be De La Hiva, et cetera. And pinning top versus bottom could be any chest-to-chest position, north-south, mount. He even refers to rear mount as a pinning situation, just like Danaher does as well. Uh, He also talks about turtle as a pinning situation. He also, uh, he discussed to me, because I had some questions about, well, how would you teach a standing lesson using the ecological approach? And he gave me a couple of ideas. So he said that uh, when he teaches standing, there's kind of two main fears that every athlete will have. The fear of falling and the fear of engagement. So especially with beginners, you know, you ask two white belts to start wrestling each other. <laughs> they'll kind of like do this weird hand slappy thing. I mean, that is wrestling, but uh, they'll they'll almost be afraid to get too close because they don't want the other person to shoot in on them. And they're very, very, uh, they're afraid to engage almost because they're not as confident in their techniques. They're not as confident in in the situations that can come up. And so you see them play this weird sort of game of patty cake. And there's also a fear of falling. So these two main fears, fear of falling, fear of engagement. Um, funny thing is, I don't think Greg talks about teaching break falls, as, uh, or I don't think he's an advocate for teaching break falls. Whereas you take a guy like Jigoro Kano, the creator of judo, he put a lot of emphasis on beginners learning how to break fall. And I do too. I think it's important that you know how to fall safely. Uh, he, Greg talks about teaching the standing situation in four different situations or four different engagements as he calls it. The single leg, the front head lock, the body lock, and the double unders. So, he, so some examples that you might have of training in this way, and I use this for with kids all the time. I say, okay, start in a single leg. Now, just hold the single leg for the whole round. So it's a minute round. Your, your job is just to hold the single leg. The other person's job is to free themselves with the single leg. Okay, ready? Go, right? Then the next round, you could say, okay, now your job 
is to put your partner's hands or butt on the floor. And if you do that, just let them stand back up again. Other person, try and clear the single leg, go. Or you could even make a constraint to the game and say, okay, we're going to start in a single leg. Now I want you to find a way to get to your partner's back or go to a double leg, right? So you're giving them really specific games within these engagements. Uh, front headlock, for example, you could start with a front headlock and say, okay, attacker, your goal is to either get a submission or go behind your partner or take them down, go. Other, or other person's job is to just escape, right? You could build games around all of these positions, double underhooks. You could even build a game around an over-under. I remember there was a grappling promotion called Fila, and I think in an overtime scenario, they would actually make the athletes start in an over-under position and with locked hands, and the athlete who unlocked their hands first loses. This is another thing you could do. This is like a, a mini game within itself just to uh, kind of work the Greco-Roman stand-up style, and you could make a game around that, right? So very interesting outlook, and that was sort of Greg's notes that he gave me before I started the ecological approach. So I just wanted to share those with you guys. Okay, let's start talking about some concepts. So one concept that's really great under this method is the idea of what's uh, repetition without repetition. So this is getting the athlete to perform a task or, you know, in this case, a sport, but finding different ways to finding the finding the same solution, but th with different variables being thrown at them. So vari variability allows the student to improve performance uh, by repeating the same task in different ways. This variability helps the student refine their motor skills and uh, it helps them better anticipate what's going to come next in the game and also predict reactions. So there's a really famous scientist. Who, he's a scientist of motor behavior. His name is Nikolai A. Bernstein. I'm going to quote him here. Okay. And he was big on this repetition without repetition. So the process, oh, I say, quote, the practice of the process of practice towards the achievement of new motor habits essentially consists in the gradual success of a search for optimal motor solutions to the appropriate problems. And then he goes on. Practice, when properly undertaken, does not consist in repeating the means of a solution of a motor problem time after time, but in the process of solving this problem again and again, by techniques which we changed and perfected from repetition to repetition, end quote. So what he's saying is, you don't get better at the Toriando pass by doing the Toriando pass for time and uh, for speed and repetitions. You know the classic uh, situation where you have someone just sitting there with their knees up and you're grabbing their pants. One, two, one two, right? All the way up till 20 or 30 or however many the fuck you're going to do. You don't get better at that pass necessarily doing it that way because you're not getting variables. You're not getting live reactions thrown at you. Now, let's say the bottom player is going to give you reactions. Their job is just to put their feet on your body. As you try and do the Toriando pass, make your goal to breach the knee line, or you could make their goal to reach the hip line, you can make the goal to go to a knee on belly, you can make the goal to go into chest to chest position. So now you're always going to be working against resistance. And that is really what this Nikolai A. Bernstein is saying. He's saying, okay, add resistance or add constraints, depending on the sport you're talking about, add constraints where now the athlete must adjust their motor skills to these variables. And in that way, this variability increases the performance of the athlete's motor skills. So an example of repetition without repetition. I'm going to use a couple examples. Kind of the three main skills in my life that uh, that I really like, that I've been passionate about over the years, obviously jiu-jitsu, cooking, and drumming. So I'd like to give you a drumming example. Uh, using repetition without repetition would be like me learning uh, Fool in the Rain by Led Zeppelin. But now my professor asks me to change the the uh, the frequency on the hi hat. So instead of just okay, Matt, I want you to play "Fool in the Rain" a hundred times, or play "Fool in the Rain" for two years, 
play Fool in the Rain until you play it just as good as John Bonham. And I'm in there playing Fool of the Rain. Dun, 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 right? And it's a fucking great song. And I finally mastered it after like, I don't know, three, four years. I'm like, man, I can play that song great. And then my drummer, uh, drum professor, he's like, okay, now I want you to play Cashmere. And I'm like, oh shit, well, I've only been practicing Fool in the Rain. I haven't been learning how to play Cashmere. So when I have to play a completely different song, I don't have that, uh, I, I'm not used to all those different variables being thrown at me. What if my drum coach was saying, okay, play Fool in the Rain, but uh, I want you to use this drum groove, or I want you to take the hi-hat and modify it in this way, but play everything else the same. Okay, now you got that figured out. Now play Fool in the Rain, play everything the same, but I want you to play the kicker slightly different. I want you to put the kick bass in different places here and there. Okay, go. So now I'm forced to like play this, do the same task, but I'm modifying things. And what, what it's making, what's happening is I'm learning the ability to add variability to my drumming and I can play more complex songs essentially. Or maybe I'll be able to play particular songs by ear because I'm able to to modify my drumming on the fly and change the hi-hat or change the kicker or change the snare or change the ride, right? Add, add certain things at different times. It just makes you a more effective player, right? Let's talk about cooking, for example. So my chef might say, okay, Matt, we've got a banquet party here for 30 and you've done this menu before, execute the menu, go. And then... Two hours before, I find out one of my ovens is broken, or I find out the fridge is broken, or I find out that someone didn't, someone who is I'm who's usually here with me, working with me, has called in sick today. So different variables getting thrown at me, and I can't do it the same way that I've always done it. I need to modify on the fly. Essentially, what is the result? I become more of an effective chef if I can perform under these conditions. So, um. Yeah, by by doing the same thing in a different way under different circumstances, you will improve. In jujitsu, uh, we we already talked about the constraints. We can add constraints all over jujitsu to make it different. We can change the game of jujitsu to make an athlete more um, diverse in their abilities and to have more diverse motor skills. And the way you do that is through repetition without repetition. A fight is never going to go the same way. When you have to complete a task or a goal in jiu-jitsu, it's never going to happen in the same way. There's always going to be someone fighting you in a different way. They have different style. They have a different body type, etc. It's in a it's the mats that you're training on are different from the ones you're used to, right? And so by doing different repetitions but trying to complete the same goal, you vary your motor skills and you get, quote, experience. You can solve the problem under certain, under many different circumstances, not just one set of circumstances where it's always, always, always the same. All right. All right. Let's talk about the concept of contextual interference. This is something that Greg talks about a lot in practice. Uh, contextual interference is where basically you do something that is different from what you just worked on. So imagine you did a practice and, you know, the first half of the lesson is half guard pinning. We're trying to pass from the half guard. We're trying to just hold from the half guard. We're trying to do certain things from half guard pinning. Maybe we're trying to get a Kimura control from the half guard. Doesn't matter. Then after you do a couple of games from that position, doing something completely different. So maybe you're now doing back control you're doing uh, Kimura control, you're sparring that position, you're sparring, I don't know, Omoplata. So what you're asking is, you're asking the brain to do something completely novel and completely different um, where it was just for a moment, you know, it's it, for like 30 minutes, your brain was like, okay, I'm comfortable with this, I know what we're doing, and then you throw something completely new at it, right? That's contextual interference. So by increasing the novelty of practice, you stimulate learning centers in the brain and this overall improves skill development. Um, I follow the Greg Souders method, which we will talk about a little bit later in the podcast. He talks about how he structures his classes. So 
basically the first, I, my classes are two hours long. The first hour is broken into two halves, essentially. The first half is a, is one topic, and then the second half of the first hour is something completely different. And this creates contextual interference. So my students are getting used to uh, open guard stuff. We do that for a half hour, and then all of a sudden, they're defending arm bars, and their brain is like, what the fuck are you doing to me? Like, I... I'm not ready to defend arm bars. Okay, I guess we got to do it anyways, right? So these are like, th this is how you can add diversity to your class and create contextual interference. Contextual interference increases information retention. Um, but at, at the same time, usually the student will notice that uh, the result in practice is poorer performance. So the student might suck it up in practice because it's hard. Contextual interference is not easy. It's not comfortable. And their practice might suffer. So they might feel like, man, I got fucked up in training today. But at the same time, they don't see these immediate gains. But at the same time, uh, there's huge gains in the long run in terms of skill development, motor skills, information retention. But like I said, the student does not often perceive that they have gained in the long run. All they perceive in the short run is I sucked in practice and I want you to uh, a common thing that I've had people tell me hey, I like when we spend a month working on a specific topic, okay? And that's how I used to do things. Okay, we'll do a month on De La Hiva, or we'll do a month on X guard, a month on arm bars, et cetera, et cetera. The result is after the first month, immediately after the month, you feel great when you're doing triangles or arm bars or whatever that you were working on. But now ask that same student to recall the information 10 months later when we've done t 10 other modules since then. Okay, go back to the arm bars that we did in January. It's now, I don't know, November. Uh, let's recall the whole month of arm bars that we did. You know, it's not as easy as if you perform tasks on almost a weekly level. So this is uh, something called interleaving, where you take tasks that you performed previously, ideally in the previous week lessons, and you bring them back today. So again, I will talk about the class structure that Greg, talk, uh, Greg has laid out for me, but essentially he works in these weekly modules and then he interleaves the stuff that he did in the previous week for the current week. And then next week, he will interleave the stuff you're doing this week, right? So he's always sort of layering in the experience, layering in the uh, contextual interference so that you have to recall things, but you're not waiting 10 months to recall them. You're recalling them within a week or two weeks time. And that way that really charges the brain up and uh, it helps you retain information. All right, let's talk about some Greg Souter's outlooks. So he says the first thing to teach somebody is how to analyze the effect of an intended outcome. So th this variability is essentially the first thing you change when you're trying to get people to learn. This is how he approaches it. So when I'm going to teach someone a goal in jiu-jitsu, the best thing to do this is, how to, uh, is to analyze the effect of an intended outcome, right? Tell them, okay, what is the problem to be solved? And what is, how are we going to get to that solution? He says that there is no techniques, even though that's, we know, as we know the word technique to be, we know that that's not true, but he looks at it as there's not techniques, there's only solutions to problems. And there is no right or wrong techniques, just effective or ineffective. So someone might say, hey, you're doing that arm bar wrong, don't do it like that. Are they doing it wrong or is it just not being applied effectively? Is it not being applied in the right context? I've caught myself doing this as a coach where I've said, hey, you're doing that technique wrong. Do it like this. Don't do it like that. Okay. But now I look at it and I'm like, was I correct? Maybe there would be a time when you would use it that way, depending on the variability. How do you know that that's never going to be a way to do something? And I have found myself to be incorrect in that way in that I jumped the gun and was too myopic. And I said, hey, uh, I shouldn't say don't do it like this. And I shouldn't micromanage my my students' movements and say, no, just move, move a little bit over here. No, 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 don't do it this way. Move your elbow a little bit this way, right? Instead of doing that, I might give them advice to say, 
hey, get back to the inside position with your frames. And then the athlete self-organizes and finds find their own way. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. The variables in jujitsu are so infinite. You know, your elbow could be a millimeter this way or a millimeter this way or a millimeter this way. Uh, your, your opponent, the body type could be completely different from the last person you wrestled with. So by giving specific goals in training and just saying, find a solution to this problem and self-organize rather than always keep your elbow locked at this angle, you are going to add variability and allow the student to self-organize and find their own solutions, improving their motor skills. So games can be designed for tactics, mechanics, and strategy. Greg talks about how tactics are like momentary wins. They're the small battles within jujitsu, right? Getting an underhook, passing the guard, uh, getting chest to chest, etc. Then there's mechanics. How to use your body versus your opponent's body, which is constantly changing. So how can you lock a kimura when someone's trying to not let you put them in a kimura and finish the kimura or transition to a triangle or pass their guard or whatever? So tactics, mechanics, and then strategy. Strategy is kind of the holistic game, the ent- the whole game, as Greg calls it. And this is uh, like trying to develop a game plan for the entire match, let's say. Or how are we going to take the whole game that's as it's played as a whole from start to finish? How are we going to win that? That's the strategy. All right. Let's just discuss my general findings with this method. So uh, I find that this live training style, the ecological approach, is incredibly useful for skill development uh, and also gaining experience in these specific positions because you're spending so much time in these positions. Compare this to training live with someone and saying, okay, fight. It's like you may never see many different positions. You might not even see a submission. How do you know that you're improving in these areas? You might be improving overall, but you're not necessarily improving your Kimura control. You're not improving leg locks, you know, by forcing yourself into these situations and trying to find solutions to problems, you are forcing yourself to get better at these, uh, at these situations. I've noticed improvements in specific positions. I've, I've noticed improvements in my cardio strength, my conditioning, identifying common reactions because I'm putting myself in so much live sparring. I use this approach with all my students. It doesn't matter what age they are for the young kids, the older kids, beginners, advanced, gi, no gi. I use this for all of them, okay? And uh, I really, really like it, especially for the kids because, and I spoke to Greg uh, Greg about this, kids don't really like to stand on a wall and watch you do a technique. And then who's to say that asking them to regurgitate the technique you just did is the best way to foster skills, Kids, human kids, and even uh, young animals in the animal kingdom often like to use play as a way to build skills and build strength. Lions, when they're cubs, will play, and uh, this simulates hunting and fighting. Lions are very, very uh, active fighters in the animal kingdom. They got to fight and kill tough, tough animals for their prey. Often they have to kill each other when they take over a pride and they're looking to mate. So they simulate this combat as cubs and they're learning the way they're learning combat through playing, which is exactly what we get the kids to do in jujitsu. You know, instead of instead of getting the kids to stand on the wall, which is what I think a lot of people do and what I used to do and say, okay, do this technique, learn this technique, do this technique just like I did it. Go. Instead, you're building target sparring situations and getting the kids to go live immediately. And what you'll find is kids respond super well to that because they love to play. Kids do not want to just listen and try and regurgitate. They'll be on the wall and after about 30 seconds of talking, you look at them and they're looking over there and they're yawning and they just, their mind wanders away. And it's, uh, it's not right or wrong. It's just how their brains are developing still. They don't have the attention span. You will notice some kids will be able to do this. But the majority, I would say, you start to lose interest, okay? And the kids kind of get into this game where they're just pretending to listen and you're pretending that they're also listening, which is not really what we want, okay? Uh, In terms of just hours put in, 
I believe that the ecological approach is by far the most time efficient way to train. Um, it's the I've noticed the biggest yield versus the time spent in practice. So when you're in practice, you know, a, what's a classic jujitsu class? Maybe it's an hour and a half, maybe it's two hours. The first hour is generally the quote technique portion of the class. So that's where you might do drilling. That's where you might show a technique or two or three and get your students to perform the technique, right? And then after that, it's time to roll. Whereas in this situation, the first hour of class is all live. It's all against resistance. That being said, doesn't have to be 100%. It could just be light or it could be 100% if that's what you want. Um, but you, you're, you're asking your students to put so much more time in in this method against resistance. And that's really the difference maker here. It really harkens back to when we were talking about Japanese jiu-jitsu versus judo. And the main differences between the training pedagogy and Kano really insisted that Randori was the main, uh, the backbone of judo training compared to Japanese jiu-jitsu where kata was the main backbone of, of training. Oh, I can't really do this move on you against live resistance because if I do that, I'll kill you or I will remove your testicles or I will gouge your eyes out. Whereas Kano was like, wait a minute. How can I know that I can actually rip someone's nuts off in an actual fight? I need my students to be able to train safely day after day and make it as realistic as possible. So I'm going to remove a bunch of these uh, Fugazi techniques and I'm going to really insist on the safe techniques that work under live resistance. And that was kind of Kano's uh, philosophy. Um, that being said, I, I, this is where I differ from Greg. Greg is very much, uh, I don't want to say set in his ways, but he is certain that what he is doing is extremely effective, okay? And I don't get the vibe from him that he likes to train under no resistance, which is fine. I still believe that there is merit in drilling certain techniques and mechanics under no resistance. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you just saw a heel hook that you've never done or an inversion that you've never done or a technique, I don't know. You can't tell what that technique feels like yet. And so you need to, um, you know, it's a, it just doesn't get very intricate. You need to feel it first before you put it into a, uh, into a live situation. Personally, I think that's good. I think you should sit down and play with it with a partner who's not resistant, working with them. And that non-resisting partner is giving you feedback on the on the position and saying, no, do it like this. Okay, this feels tight. No, this doesn't feel tight. Then as soon as you can feel it under no resistance, I would immediately start adding resistance. Start building games and, and making constraints around that position so that you can start mapping out live reactions. So I still think that drilling with non-resistance does have some merit, but it shouldn't be the majority of your class lesson. I don't really see the value in speed drills not against resistance anymore. I will admit this can achieve some results, whether you're working with like a beginner or kids or someone who's completely new. Toriando passes. Okay, here's the goal. Get to get past the hip line. Okay, go. Can you do that? You can do that. But I don't really think that it is you're not going to get as much out of it as you would as if the bottom player was just like very lightly trying to recover frames. Even just adding that little bit of resistance will make it way more effective. Um, the ecological approach, I also want to discuss using this method in the gi because Greg is not a fan of the gi, as you guys know, uh, through my episode with him and a lot of you guys hated on him for it. Um... So when you're watching his videos, he does, he is not showing gi grips. It's all no gi. So I had to develop my own ways of incorporating the gi into the ecological approach, and I'm still developing it. These games that I developed were based around getting dominant grips um, and sparring these dominant gripped positions, trying to break grips, um, you know, uh, or or maybe 
getting to a, a specific grip, like sparring from the back, okay, your goal is to get the collar grip. Once you get the collar grip, reset the game. Things like that, right? Find ways to get specific grips, dominant grips. The gi game really revolves heavily around gripping. And I think it's really important that your games, when you're using the ecological approach, reflect that necessity to have grips. Whereas in no gi, it's like, okay, my partner grabs my arm and I just pull it away and the grip breaks. You know, it's not like I'm grabbing their collar and now they can't break the grip for extended periods of time. So you do have to, if you're going to use this approach with the gi, make sure that your games include realistic grips that are going to be required in a live situation, I guess is the best way you could put it. Like never make your games uh, deter the athlete from doing something that they might do in a live situation and always include aspects of the game that your athlete will need to be successful in said game, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so the ecological approach, it's not, it's not really all that new, but I think that implementing a practice entirely around the ecological approach compared to a traditional jujitsu practice, that is a relatively new concept. <clears throat> so what this means is, you know, Greg's entire first hour of class before free rolling is based around games. So he's not showing techniques. And this is very, very unconventional, I would say. We've always done target sparring in jujitsu but we've never based an entire practice around that. And we've never really told the student to find their own solution. We've always sort of given them the, the, the techniques and asked them to regurgitate them. Okay, now regurgitate them, but the person you're regurgitating them against is fighting back and they might be bigger than you. They might be smaller than you. They might be fatter. They might be stronger, et cetera. How are you going to come up with those different variables if you haven't practiced in a live situation? So... <clears throat> it is, I would say, uncommon for most gyms to not teach techniques and only teach games, but I think it is becoming more and more common. I would say that this methodology is a powerful way to proof techniques. So let's say I discovered a technique and I'm like, hey, I've been doing this thing. It's working for me really well. Make a game of it. Put it into practice right away. See if you can break it, right? See if you can improve upon it. See if you can... Uh, work with your partner and try and find ways that that technique joins to other techniques that you already do. Using this ecological approach, you basically are troubleshooting things and you're working very specific situations. I think it's a really effective way to map out predictable responses using this ecological approach. And I believe in a healthy balance between techniques and games. So even though I love the games and I think it's super effective, I think there's a time to take your students aside and say, hey, I just want to show you guys this because I'm looking around the room and like, I think if you guys use this, it would really improve. And then I would play the game again, right? I'm not going to show a move and get my students to regurgitate it against non-resistance. But what I might do is get them to spar the game, bring them all together, say, hey, guys, you should do it like this or try thinking about you doing something in this way or look out for this technique. It's available for you. Try again. And then I'll just get them to spar again. So they're, they have an idea in their mind that they can try to do if the opportunity arises, but they're still solving the problem in front of them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, my throat is a little bit raspy today. Uh, let's talk about you're the gym owner, you're the head coach, and you're trying to sell this approach to your students. You're trying to get them excited about this approach. I found that when I discussed to my team about this, after I had my conversation with Greg, some of them were concerned that they weren't going to, um, they were concerned that this meant that they were going to learn fewer techniques or learn less jujitsu. They were also concerned that their mistakes would not be addressed or corrected, which is not true. Um, just understand as the coach, it is up to you to develop games that bring out the skills needed to win the game of jujitsu. So there are specific problems that need to be solved during this game of jujitsu and how you build your games will or will not allow the athlete to find solutions to those problems. Um, it is also 
I think the main, when you're using this approach, the main responsibility of the coach is to come around and just make sure that students are staying within the constraints of the game. You know, oh, your job is to only hold half guard chest to chest. Why are you passing? Right. Or your job was to just breach the knee line from the open guard. Why are you passing? Why are you getting chest to chest? You're supposed to just hold the position as long as you can. So you'll walk around the room and you'll notice right away that people's lizard brain turns on when they start grappling and they will start to just fight. <laughs> they will just start to do normal, like especially for kids, because, again, they they're very, very good at not paying in, uh, attention to instruction. I think one of the best thing kids can learn is how to listen and how to actually take what you're saying to them and listen and be able to utilize it and not deviate away from instructions because they do it every fucking practice. But as the coach, you need to give them specific constraints and then make sure they stay within those constraints. Oh, you weren't even supposed to pass the guard. Why are you doing it? You weren't supposed to submit your partner. Why are we going into submissions? So one of the most common things I say in practice is, hey, stay within the constraints of the game. You're not doing that, right? <clears throat> and I also think that it's important to encourage people to train maybe when they're first starting with this approach. Tell them, hey, it's not about winning the game. It's about being able to do all of the games and still have enough gas in the tank for your regular sparring. Because I'll be honest with you, the first hour of practice using these games gets exhausting. It gets really, really tiring, especially if students are going like 100%. Sorry, I got to drink some water. <clears throat> especially if the students are always going 100%. You can't have them going 100%, uh, especially if they're brand new, and then expect them to be able to do all of the games in the first hour and then roll. They're just going to be exhausted. I find a lot of my students who go too hard in the games during free roll, they only stick around for a couple rounds and then they're out. They've had enough training. Okay. But you might have some really high level athletes, some absolute specimens that can go harder. So it's going to depend on the, on the partners. It's going to depend on the goal of the, of the practice. And yeah, not only do athletes need to stay within the constraints of the game, but they need to work at a pace that will allow them to complete all of the games. And I will say it's exhausting because mentally you're asking yourself to do a lot, especially when you're changing the position halfway through and adding contextual interference. And it's exhausting physically because you're moving your body against resistance the whole time. So it's like you're sparring, except you have to think a lot. You're asking a lot of your mind and your body in doing this way. So one of the best things that I said to my students as we were just sort of embracing this was I said, hey, Try to play the game at a little bit of a lower intensity, at least initially. As you get more used to this approach, maybe in a couple of weeks, increase intensity, right? But for now, don't even worry about winning the game. Remove your ego and just try to play the game with your partner. Try not to beat them. Try to monitor reactions and, and, and understand what is the problem to be solved. Games can be used for a variety of purposes training till exhaustion or simulating competition. We could be training for skill development. We could be studying reactions. I think that this is something that's good to be addressed to the class and just say, hey, we've got competition coming up. I want you guys to get fucking exhausted today. Go, right? Or you could say, hey guys, we've had a hard training week. Let's chill it out a little bit today. Let's just focus on, you know, acquiring skills. Let's go a little bit lighter today. That's okay. And I don't think that that necessarily means that practice isn't going to be as effective if you're going lighter. Honestly, I think sometimes it's necessary to have lighter training sessions as long as you're training your brain, right? And understand that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to interleaving and, and modifying the modules, students may or may not see immediate progress. They think, oh, I'm not progressing because we're not spending a month on arm bars. So I'm not learning that much about arm bars. I want to spend the entire class on arm bar and I want to spend a whole month on arm bar. So I get really, really good at arm bars. Okay, great. But 10 months from now, are you still going to be as good at arm bars? Okay, you're probably not. You're probably going to be thinking about the other 10 blocks that you studied and arm bars are just going to be like a distant memory for you, okay? 
So students th think that they're progressing more when you do giant chunks of learning in a, in a small amount of time because they can perceive it. They can say, okay, I know I'm getting better at arm bars, but the truth is in the long run, that information does not retain as well as if you add contextual interference and you interleave previous lessons on a regular basis. So not even on like monthly blocks, but like weekly blocks. Students in scientific studies have retained more knowledge when taking this approach. Let's talk about using the ecological approach for new techniques. So we're not going to teach techniques. How are we going to learn new techniques, right? Um, again, I am not uh, as myopic with my view as other people. I think that moves should be felt initially without resistance, but immediately add resistance. As soon as you feel the technique, you get the idea, you understand the general mechanics of the move, start adding resistance to the move. Start getting your partner to try and escape the move or counter the move or prevent the move. I think the goal overall should be to practice against some degree of resistance because that is fighting. You're always going to get the problem of fighting is movement. You're always going to get movement coming up when you're uh, grappling someone. And so I think it's really important to always just have the goal in mind to add, as resi add resistance as often as you possibly can. And if you are good with that, increase the amount of resistance, increase the intensity over time. Okay, developing finishing mechanics. So I want to just discuss a couple of things that I'd, I came across when it came time to develop finishing mechanics using this method uh, where we're essentially not teaching techniques. So I, would, I get my guys to like look at a given submission um, and look at finishing the submission as a way to find a solution to the problem. So getting the tap or getting the finish is the solution to the problem. I believe, again, I'll say, when you're learning like a new heel hook or something, you should feel that without resistance first. Why not teach the mechanics first so the students have a general idea as to what to do and the person who's receiving the technique knows what it feels like so they get a they start to judge they start to gauge when or when they shouldn't tap, right? But then immediately start sparring the position, start building games and constraints around this said Submission. We based games around fully locked submissions versus defense, and this was on Greg's recommendation. So start in a fully locked triangle, uh, try and get out. Or start in a trap triangle where the triangle is not completely locked in a figure four, but the ankles are crossed. Start from there. Uh, start from an arm bar with hands locked. Start with an arm bar with the arm fully extended, but the person is not allowed to finish the arm bar. They're just holding and controlling. Right, So if they can control the Jujigatame position for long periods of time, in theory, they should be able to be more effective at finding the finish because the longer you can spend controlling certain positions, the more your chance increases of you finishing the submission. So you can build games based around fully locked submissions versus defense, and you can build these games in different stages of the submission. Maybe we're starting from saddle, and you have both of my legs controlled, or maybe not. Maybe you have tombstone control where you have both hands on the primary leg, okay? And now you're trying to get your dig mechanics. If you can dig the heel and hold it for three seconds, you win. Okay, now let's start in a fully locked heel hook, and the person is only trying to hold the heel hook. They're not allowed to apply their hips. <clears throat> Other person is practicing heel slipping in late stage defenses. So... <clears throat> building games can be based around the concept of control rather than actually finishing. And obviously, you know, you guys are probably like, you're, you're asking me to start in a fully locked heel hook. Are you fucking insane? Yeah, that is kind of insane. I'm not going to lie. It sounds ridiculous um, because it's a fine line between injury and growth. However, you have to have knowledgeable, trustworthy training partners they know about that submission. They know how to control it and they know how to keep you safe. I'm not going to take day one white belts and teach them a heel hook and say, okay, now spar this fully locked heel hook. That would not be smart. But I could take white belts and potentially say, okay, the arm is fully extended. 
Just hold the position and keep your partners back on the floor. That's your only goal for the three minutes is just keep their back on the floor. Uh, if their back comes off the floor, reset the game. Or if their back comes off the floor, return them to the floor and don't let them clear their elbow, right? You could be, you can make games anywhere. <clears throat> and I think that that is a good strategy if the room is in agreement that, hey, the goal is not to win. The goal is to practice control mechanics and just to improve and help each other improve. Because a lot of people tend to deviate and try to defeat each other in training, which obviously is good in a competitive room. But at the same time, there's also training that is based around skill acquisition. So you will find that students do find this approach a little bit damaging to the ego, starting in fully locked submissions, starting in chest-to-chest -chest positions, and it feels like you suck. It feels like your practice is uh, pretty poor performance. <clears throat> and you should be getting submitted from these positions. You should be getting your guard pass. These are late stage positions. But spending large portions of time in late stage defenses or late stage defensive cycles is extremely beneficial for the offensive and the defensive athletes. The offensive athletes really dial in how to finish their techniques and the defensive athletes get a lot of experience defending. It reminds me of when Danaher was on Lex Friedman's podcast and he's talking about how people come to the gym, they go to New Wave and they they train with Gary Tonin, they submit him like five times and they're, they go up to John and they're like, hey, I submitted Gary Tonin, like I'm doing really good. And John's like, oh, that's very, very impressive, you know? But the thing is, is Gary Tonin's allowing this to happen. He allows people to put on fully locked submissions and then he sees if he can get his way out, right? He, he wants to see how far he can take a submission before he's forced to tap, right? And to do that, you really have to have no ego. You have to not care how you appear to other people. You have to not care. Uh, you have to be you have to be secure and confident in your own skills to such a degree that you know that poor performance in the training room does not equate to poor performance on the big stage, right? You're getting so much experience in these late stage defenses, these late positions, that when you get to the big stage, you know that you'll be able to escape or you know that there's a good chance you'll be able to escape because you've been put in that position so, so many times. All right, let's just, uh, before we get out of here, I just want to run down, you know, a quick way to create games, the design principles and, and uh, you know, how the games are structured, the actual framework of the games. And again, this comes from Greg Souders. He helped me a lot with this. Thank you, Greg. So he says there's four basic design principles. There's the principle of intentionality. So knowing what the intended outcome of the practice is, uh, or knowing the intention of the practice or the game you're playing. It might be exhaustion. It might be skill acquisition, etc. Uh, he calls this next principle represented design. So uh, just your training environment should represent the competition environment as closely as possible. You know, whether you're greasing, whether you're training without a shirt, no rest, you know, training when you're exhausted, uh, adding crowd Brazilian soccer noises through the uh, speakers. However, you can mimic the training environment however you can mimic the actual competition environment and replicate it in training, that is the idea of represented design. So you develop as close as you can your training environment to the real thing. Repetition without repetition, we talked about this. This is repeating a situation, um, repeating the problem without the same solution and trying to find a solution. And then the last principle is what Greg called Craig, uh, Greg, pardon me, calls constraint to afford. So give tasks to focus attention on a solution. So the four design principles, how are you going to design your games? Intentionality, represented design, repetition without repetition, and constraint to afford. Remember that games can be developed for basically any situation, submissions, pins, uh, transitions, doesn't really matter, takedowns. Games should be created based on developing solutions to very, very specific problems. So uh, sometimes games, th this is just my opinion, sometimes games will not be successful or have the desired effect or different constraints 
could have made the game more effective uh, to reach the solution that you want the athlete to achieve. I think it's really important that if you are implementing this this style, this system with your students, understand that just like any skill development and you are developing the skill of using the ecological approach in training, that trial and error is a crucial stage in developing your ability to use this approach. Sometimes I'll give people um, a game and I'll say to myself, within the first 30 seconds, I'm seeing people starting to fuck things up. And I'm like, oh yeah, I could have given a constraint that would have made it better for them. It would have been more effective if I had used this constraint. So we come back, I change it, we go back, see if that had any effect on the desired outcome that I wanted them to have, right? So just understand that like, you know, it's you're using something novel and you're going to fuck it up. And to just be patient with yourself and to just keep... Uh, just to keep trying. And if you find games that you like, stick with them, modify them, play with them, uh, have fun with it, you know? It, and of course, one thing Greg always talks about, you can always message this guy and literally just pick his brain. He's extremely generous with his time. So I recommend any instructors out there do that. Um, I now believe, so another finding that I had is I now believe that interleaving uh, previous topics on a regular basis and weekly module rotations, they're by far the most effective way to train when, uh, I won't say that statement. I'll say it's far more effective than monthly modules. And rem remind yourselves that this is backed upon science. This is backed on scientific studies that have shown that interleaving information increases um, knowledge retention and skill acquisition. Whereas big blocks and big chunks often get forgotten with, within time. You have to constantly be recalling said information over time. And it's good to do contextual interference too, because like I said, it stimulates centers in the brain, learning centers. Um, make sure that you're interleaving new topics on a frequent basis. And uh, yeah, not just sticking with big blocks of content. Okay, let's just, before we get out of here, we're going to talk about the framework of classes. So Greg splits his classes. Uh, he has like, he has like, uh, he calls it three time breaks. So how long is each round going to be? Usually if it's top or bottom, like it's a, it's a game that can be switched where the student has two perspectives, top or bottom, right? He breaks that into two rounds. So each round is usually three minutes long. It could also be a six minute round, Okay. But he says usually three minutes are the are the amount of, of the round of each athlete per perspective. But there might be some games where, let's say we're target sparring from 50-50, which is a neutral position. So there is no top and bottom perspective. You might say, okay, this is a six-minute round. Or even Craig says here, there's a 10-minute round. So he he I don't usually do 10-minute rounds. I usually do six-minute rounds if we're gonna do something like that, because I find that is quite a bit of time. But three minutes for switched partners, six minutes or 10 minutes for uh, neutral positions or for a whole game, as he calls it, which is just rolling, I guess you could say. Uh, he says when he's developing games, there's two types of goals. So terminal goals and continuous goals. So a terminal goal is where you are, uh, there's a goal that can be actually achieved. And if it is achieved, reset the game. A continuous goal is where the goal literally can't be achieved. The game can't be won. It's just uh, a continuous game. So this might be like, okay, top player gets past the feet and breaches the knee line. This is a classic Greg Souders game. I love it. And he says, just hold the knee line position as long as you can. Don't reset, don't reset the game. Just hold it as long as you can. Bottom player has to recover. There's no way to win the game. So two types of goals, either terminal or continuous. And then how he breaks it down is he says he takes three games from the situation of the week. So he'll, he'll have a situation of the week. Remember earlier I said the three macro situations, standing versus standing, top versus bottom guard, top versus bottom pins. So he says there's a situation of the week. He might be working on a standing situation. So he does three games from that standing situation, which equals about 30 minutes, if not a little bit more, because he's got to explain it what the goals are or whatever. And then he adds contextual interference halfway through. He adds 
usually two more games from the previous lesson plans. So three games based around the situation of the week, followed by two games of the previous lesson plan. And then uh, usually what he does is he says he pers- he switches perspectives top and bottom uh, each week. Okay, I find when you're playing these games, you're kind of getting the top and bottom perspective at the same time. So if it's top versus bottom half guard, cross face and underhook, you are, they are both working top versus bottom, but the top player has the cross face and underhook. They're in the offensive cycle. Bottom player's getting pinned in the half guard. They're on the defensive cycle. So if you wanted to change perspectives week to week, next week you could do half guard, but you could have the bottom player have the underhook and the top player is in the defensive position. Bottom player has the underhook and they're working their way out. So again, it's limitless what you can do with this stuff, guys. And once you really start playing with it, and I hope you do, you start to see how limitless it is. It, you, you can see how you can build games around these different positions, and you start to get some pretty cool results. All right? And that's going to be our show for the day. I hope that wasn't boring. I hope you're not sick of hearing me talk about the ecological approach. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Gray, uh, Dr. Dr. Greg Souders. He'd love that. Thank you to Greg Souders and thank you to Dr. Rob Gray, who, I, uh, like I said, he has got a couple books on this exact topic. This is his research. And, uh, you know, without him, we I don't know if we would have the ecological approach, but uh, I certainly wouldn't have it the way that I understand it. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Rob Gray and Greg Souders. Guys, you can check out Greg Souders' social media below. I've left links there. Check out his YouTube page too if you want to see how he runs classes. Very, very cool stuff. Um, also, in I've, I've left some links below for some literature that you guys can check out. A couple books by Rob Gray. There's another great book called Make It Stick, uh, The Science of Successful Learning. That's a really great book too. So check that out in the links below. And if you want to like, uh, share, and subscribe again, guys, I really, really appreciate any traction I can get with the show. Please get it out there if you're enjoying it so far. If you're not, I am sorry for wasting your time. Don't share it if you don't like it. And if you want to contact me or support the show, the links are on the bottom. I'll say this, guys, just real quick. Uh, I I don't make money off this show. <laughs> I do this show because I love jiu-jitsu and I love to talk about jiu-jitsu and I'm hoping that you guys are getting value out of it. But... If you guys can support the show, it does make my life a lot easier. I got bills to pay just like everyone else. I got two kids, you know, uh, and uh, I have an online academy. If you subscribe, it would really help me out. It's 10 bucks a month. The link is in the bottom. I also have a kid's book for you parents out there. But other than that, I'm going to stop plugging my content. You guys can know where to find me. You know how to support me. And I really appreciate you guys coming out here listening to me. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Anyways, I'll see you guys next week, okay? Just remember, the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. Love you guys. Bye-bye.